Okay, good morning and welcome. We want to thank each person and every person for being here today. People have traveled from all over the country to be with us for an incredibly exciting announcement. And I just want to thank you for giving up your time to be with here today and to support what's taking place here in the state of South Carolina. Uh, for those of you who do not know, my name is Kenny Bingham. I'm currently a Senior Government Affairs Advisor for the law firm of Adams & Reese. And for the past 11 months, our team here at Adams and Reese has had the um, unique fortune and privilege of working with Concordance as they look to partner with the state of South Carolina on a program of services designed that will lower recidivism rates, reduce crime, and help break the generational cycles of incarceration. Uh, for 16 years, I actually had the privilege of serving here in the South Carolina House of Representatives, including a stint as majority leader, so I've done more press conferences than I probably ever care to remember, uh, but today is the first time in seven years since I walked out of that chamber that I've been a part of a press conference. And what a great feeling it is because we're not talking about something we want to do, we're talking about something that's going to happen. And it is an exciting thing and I could not be more pleased or proud of what is going to take place here and the speakers that we have behind here. Uh, my role today is simply to introduce you uh, to four very esteemed speakers that's going to be presenting today and talking about the work that is going to take place here in the state of South Carolina. Uh, our first speaker today, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak, um, is uh, former Secretary Bill Daly. Uh, Secretary Daly is Vice Chairman and Public Affairs of Wells Fargo. Um, he is a member of the company's operating committee. He actually joined Wells Fargo in 2019 and oversees the company's philanthropic giving program. Throughout Mr. Davis's esteemed career, he has held numerous roles in both public service as well as private finance. He is a lawyer by profession, and he served as the White House Chief of Staff to President Barack Obama, and he has served as the U.S. Secretary of Commerce underneath President Bill Clinton. Following uh, Secretary Daley will be uh, Mr. Danny Luderman. Uh, Danny is currently the Chairman and CEO of Concordance Academy, a nonprofit organization providing holistic, evidence-based um, re-entry programs for formerly incarcerated individuals. Concordance has a proven track record of reducing, repeat, of reducing repeat criminal offenses from individuals returning uh, to the community. They have lowered reincarceration rates by 56% in the home state of Missouri. Before retiring um, to start Concordance, uh, Danny was the president and CEO of Wells Fargo Advisors. It is the second largest wealth manager in the country. Uh, following uh, Mr. Ludeman will be none other than our own uh, director of the Department of, Com of Department of Corrections, excuse me, uh, Director Brian Sterling. While there are many positive attributes and accomplishments that we could talk about today um, in Director Sterling's career, the one thing that jumps out to me personally is that when I think about Director Sterling is that he has been a transformational leader. There are many great leaders and many people that take over organizations that are, are, that are doing well and, and advance the cause. But it's something different when you find the unique nature of somebody who steps in to an organization that is in need of help and transforms that organization into what it's become today. It requires far more than just telling somebody what to do or enacting a new program. It takes a leadership by example, because in order to be transformational, you must have buy-in from all of his staff and all of the support and the people who have been there when times are not as good. They have to buy into your vision and your direction. And Brian Sterling has led by example. When you look around me today at all of his wardens and all of his deputy and senior staff level um, administrators that are here that have bought into his leadership style, it is truly amazing and an accomplishment that he's going to take with him as his legacy. For nine and a half years, Director Sterling has dedicated his life to the Department of Corrections. Transformation doesn't come about quickly. It takes time, it takes commitment, it takes dedication because those on the outside are looking in and they're watching what you do. Until they know that you mean what you say and that you're doing what you've told them you want to do, they're not going to follow that. But that is not what has taken place at the Department of Corrections. When Director Sterling took over, they were the fifth lowest funded Department of Corrections in the nation. You say, well, how does that matter? 
What matters because they don't have money for salaries. Their salaries are some of the lowest. Their report, employee retention was some of the lowest. Their ability to fix facility needs and infrastructure, which was failing, they did not have the funds to do that. But Director Sterling took over and started leading an agency, building credibility with the members of the General Assembly because there was a buy-in of his vision, not only from him, but from his leaders and the people internally. What Director Sterling has done has been incredible. Flash forward nine and a half years from taking over an agency that was the fifth lowest funded agency in the country and look at what is happening today. No further um, attribute is needed than to look at what happened in January of this year, in 2023. Uh, director Sterling was the first South Carolina director to ever receive the National Correction Leaders Association's Tom Clements Award. It recognizes the director that has done an incredible job for the work that has transformed an agency in a positive and productive manner. And that award went to Director Sterling. This is not by accident, it's not by chance, it's the result of not only the hard work and dedication of Director Sterling, but every single member of his staff and his support team. If you have not had an opportunity to meet with these individuals, I hope and trust you will do so today and see what they're doing. I, for one, have been incredibly impressed by their work, the dedication, and what they have brought to the table. And finally, without any further ado, our last speaker today is going to be none other than our very own Gover McMaster, another transformational leader here in the state of South Carolina. While Governor McMaster truly does not need an introduction to any one of those, any one of us who live here in the state of South Carolina, but for the benefit of our guests who's traveled from afar in order to come be with us today, I want you to know that Governor McMaster has given his life to public service and specifically dedicated that public service to all of us here in the state of South Carolina. His vision for our state has always been to make South Carolina a better place for every single citizen. And what we're here to announce today and the partnerships that are announced today is going to continue to add upon that legacy that he is creating here in the state. For the past six and a half years, Governor McMaster has led our state with a steady hand and a laser focus on improving that quality of life. When I think about him, he hits all three of these markers. He is a true Southern gentleman, he is a statesman, and he is a servant leader. Those three attributes are hard to find in any one individual, and Governor McMaster's life exudes each of those qualities. His leadership styles and accomplishments are without question, and when he finishes his current term as governor here in South Carolina in January of 2027, Governor McMaster will lead this office as the longest serving governor in the history of South Carolina with a 10-year tenure. That's incredible. Without Without any further ado for myself, I want to turn it over to Secretary Daly. Great. Thanks, Kenny. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenny, Governor McMaster, uh, Director Sterling, other distinguished guests, uh, my colleagues from uh, Wells Fargo, Christy Furco is here, who's also a member of our operating committee, and we are proud to be here in this great state. We're proud of the leadership that the governor has shown Obviously, the issue of challenging incarceration and recidivism is a national issue. As was mentioned by Kenny, this state is at the forefront of changing that which we have all are embarrassed by in our nation. And, and Concordance has put together a program, and we are proud at Wells Fargo to be part of that effort. This is an economic issue. Some people may talk about it in different ways, but we at Wells Fargo, obviously we care, and the governor has shown incredible leadership in this state to build your economy and diversify your economy, but bringing people from incarceration and getting them back into society, not only is that a societal positive, but it is an economic positive, because the people who come out of prison should be able to be successful and add to our economic growth in each of the states. So Charlie Scharf, our CEO of Wells, we are extremely proud today to announce that we are part of the expansion of Concordance as they look at expanding their centers. We've committed $60 million uh, as they expand and starting <laughs> Thank you. 
as they expand those centers around the nation, this is the first state that they've expanded and they're expanding and, and there's a reason for that because of the success what you have done, the governor and his administration, the director has done in this state and we're gonna be part of, with Concordians of building upon that success and hopefully changing that which we all should embar be embarrassed about as a nation about the lack of real attempts to help people who come back in society so that they can add to the economic growth of our nation. So it's, we're extremely proud at Wells Fargo for this effort. And uh, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Danny to tell you the things about Concordiates and tell you how proud he is of the success they've had and how optimistic they are about adding to that success. Danny? Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank all of you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, I like being in the South. I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia, so I feel much more at home with Southerners. And I just found out that, um, that the state of South Carolina actually grows more peaches than the state of Georgia, so I didn't know that before. But um, uh, this is um, a very emotional uh, day for me because we've been working at this for so long, and I can't thank um, Bill, Wells Fargo, for what really is a transformational um, effect on our mission. Uh, with these dollars, uh, coupled with um, other donors in our campaign, but without a doubt, this is the largest gift we've ever had in our history. We plan on opening up 39 additional centers throughout the country uh, over the next eight years starting with uh, the opening of our new center in Greenville-Spartanburg area. And so also can't thank the Department of Corrections, the governor, the whole staff that have just been wonderful to work with. Um, when I first learned way back after I, um, pretty quickly after I retired, that um, the devastating facts about uh, reincarceration and the reason I got involved in this from the very beginning was I heard a statistic, and that was 71% of people that are released from prison um, commit or are rearrested within a three to five year time frame. And I thought that was just incredulous. Um, and so I, at that point, uh, the heart came later, I must admit. Um, it was more of a head thing for me. I like solving big problems, big things. Um, but I've dedicated my life to understanding the issue and developing a model to solve it. Uh, in 2014, Concordance convened a group of academic, a lot of educational institutions to scientifically examine the root cause of why people go to prison in the first place and why on average they go back seven times. They call doing it life under the installment plan. And so we engage with the University of Chicago, um, the Brown School at um, Wash U, uh, many others. And we studied this problem for two and a half years before we even formed Concordance, because we wanted to understand you know, a little bit more of the facts. Um, and we also wanted to understand the other organizations that are providing reentry services. And so what the common denominator is, and it's crystal clear, is that um, Every one of our participants now in Missouri, we served about 1,600, have had a severe traumatic experience at a very young age. And I mean severe. I'm talking about, we ask, uh, have you ever been shot, stabbed, raped, physically beaten, or seen a loved one die in front of you as a result of an overdose or maybe an act of violence? And pretty much every one has had at least one of these occur by the age of nine. So just by being born in a certain place, a certain time, um, that's the population that we're serving. And if you look at state penitentiaries all over this country, 80% of people that are incarcerated have a severe mental health issue. They 83% have a severe substance use disorder. And so if you can't heal somebody first, uh, then a lot of the other things that we offer don't really matter. Uh, we also discovered quickly, the um, staggering racial equity disparity within the United States. Um, while black and Hispanic populations make up roughly 30% of the 
of the country's population that represent over 60% of those that are incarcerated. Um, and black men, if you single out them alone, are six times more likely to be incarcerated than white, and white Hispanic men nearly three times as likely. Uh, so reducing reincarceration rates has a phenomenal trickle-down effect uh, to correct these racial disparities. Concordance evidence-based Healing First reentry model effectively lowers reincarceration rates by implementing this holistic Healing First approach, addressing conditions, circumstances, and systems that both shape uh, individual and community health. Our 18-month program, it's roughly six months pre-release and then 12 months post-release, um, we're working hard and we're accredited substance use treatment center. We're also accredited mental health treatment center. And then after we heal these individuals, then we provide education, job training. Uh, we have our own employment agency where we're not finding jobs, we're actually employing them with contracts with 13 employment partners, and then bringing financial education and counseling to our individuals with the help of Wells Fargo as well. Our evidence-driven model has broken the generational cycle of incarceration. Approximately 60% of crime in this country is committed by formerly incarcerated individuals. Uh, by lowering reincarceration rates, uh, we can help reduce crime, improve public safety, and make communities safe all over this country. Concordance has successfully reduced the reincarceration rates among its participants, it was mentioned before, by about 56 percent. Uh, and more importantly, it's afforded our participants the opportunity to truly have abundant, purposeful, and joyful lives with their families. A lot of people that don't go back to prison are just barely surviving. And so while our primary goal is not to have them go back, it's much, much more. And through our sequence of, of stages throughout the 12 month post relief, uh, where our goal is to have every individual uh, at least at a middle class income. Um, and so we're now taking this proven model nationwide and um, um, like South Carolina, uh, they've embraced us. It's, a, it's amazing to me because um, I think it's been reported that South Carolina has absolutely the lowest recidivism rate of any state in America. And so the fact that they would like us to work with them is really a tribute to the state of South Carolina because as we all know, you know, businesses that are number one, they don't rest on their lawyers laurels. They're open to adopting new practices, continuous improvement, and I can't think of a better example of that than the state of South Carolina. So together we can reduce reincarceration rates. This is the third greatest societal issue in our country, bar none. There are 30 million felons in this country, and if you just add immediate family, it swells up to 130 million people. It's third, only followed by poverty and disease, which are clearly interrelated. And so um, our hope is that we can have a lasting impact on communities, the children's and families of incarcerated individuals, have an impact on our economy, public policy, homelessness, and improve racial equality. So thank you for giving me the time this morning. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to an incredible man, Director Sterling. Thank you, Danny. Um, thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Governor. And uh, Kenny, thank you for reading my mother's talking points about me. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Checks in the mail. Um, I would be um, remiss if I didn't introduce um, some of my staff that's here, and I'd just like them to raise their hand. I, um, you know, Dane and Dexter here. Dexter works with the, um, the legislature. Dane um, is, I call her Radar O'Reilly, because I'll say, Dane, I need this, and it shows up at my desk. They're over there. Um, I've got my program staff over here, and I just, they're the best program staff in the country. It's incredible what they've done. It's incredible what they're doing. So if they would raise their hands real quick. Um, they're very shy. I have um, my wardens also. Some of my wardens are here and, um, and our, our staff from security. So if y'all would raise your hand and be recognized. So. 
Anybody that leads a large organization knows that you can set a course, but if you don't have buy-in, if you're not rowing in the right direction, you know, someone's rowing left, someone's rowing right, you're just going in circles. And at Corrections, we're all rowing together. And I, I want to um, also thank the peniology staff, uh, um, peniology staff, peniology senators that are here. Senator Martin's our chairman. They've been very supportive. So this does not happen without these folks and the money and the money the governor's put in his budget. We don't get um, the funding for officers. We don't get the funding for program staff. We don't get the funding to lower recidivism. So I know a lot in the media have covered this. I see Ann Walker there. She's a good partner also. She's helped out. Um, when I took over, the Department of Corrections recidivism rate was 32 percent, which is pretty high. Um, you know, if you're playing baseball, it, that's that's pretty good. You know, you're batting 60, 600, but um, that's not good for recidivism. 85% of the folks that come to the Department of Corrections in South Carolina get out with under five years, and they're back out amongst us. So when I um, give my talks, and 95% are out um, within 10 years. We are now 17.8% with people that return under a new crime to the Department of Corrections, and with concordance, we're going to go lower. That's the goal with Wells Fargo and with their support. This not only will transform that, that person that was incarcerated, this is going to transform their family, this is going to transform their community, this will transform their county, this will also transform the state, and this is going to be transformative for the United States, I think, once they uh, spread their wings and go to other states. I know it's working great in Missouri. I know it's going to help us with what we want to do. Um, and, you know, folks may say, why does this matter? Well, I'll give you an example. And, and um, when I first took over, Governor Haley uh, appointed me. I was her chief of staff, and she said, these people are getting out. I've had similar conversations with Governor McMaster about we've got to um, help these folks to make the state safer and save tax dollars by them not coming back for a long time. I went down to the bus station at Gervais Street about 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, where it, It's an apartment complex now, but we used to drop our, our folks off there, and I was appalled at what I saw. I saw men and women still in their uniforms. We took their stripe off. Um, they still had their inmate uniforms on. They did not have clothes on their back. They didn't know where they were going. Prostitutes were there. Drug dealers were there. It was a big party. I went back to my staff and I said, we've got to do better for these folks. We've got to set them up for success and we've got to, um, we've got to help the state by saving tax dollars and making it safer. So we started partnering with folks, started partnering with Catholic Charities for housing. We have the first in the, um, in the country, um, our employment agencies actually in our prisons now. Simple things as explaining incarceration. You know, if you're interviewing for a job and you're asked, have you been incarcerated, you may say no. Well, because of insurance, they're going to do a background check. It's going to come up. So we tell them, look, own it. Say, you know what? I made some bad choices when I was younger. But look what I've done. Look what I did when I was incarcerated. We've reached out to employers. And we have a simple choice as a state, and this is how I kind of bring it home for folks when I talk to Rotaries. Just picture um, your mother or father at a bus stop or at the library or at a restaurant. You have two choices. You have a choice of a, a man that's been in prison for five years, likely has mental health issues, likely has drug addiction issues, has no hope, no future, maybe has anger management issues. Um, sitting next to them at that bus stop or that restaurant, or you have someone that's connected with their family. They are getting help for mental health. They are uh, getting treatment for, um, for drug addiction. They have a job. They have a future. They know how to deal with their anger. When you kind of bottom line it and you make it personal, people say, yeah, that's exactly what we should be doing. We should be setting people up for success and giving them hope. What Concordance is going to do on top of what we're doing is they're going to take it on the outside. We release about 6,000 people a year. 20% of those folks end up in the Spartanburg-Greenville uh, area. It's a large um, feeder to prisons, and it all, also it's a large area that we return people to. So they're going to help make Greenville-Spartanburg area a lot safer by setting these people up for success and following the soft handoff when they leave prison for a year-long program. It's amazing what they're doing. It's amazing what they've done. Um, I'm excited to see where we're going to go with this. Our recidivism rate will be lower because of Wells putting the money in, Concordance stepping up and saying we want to do this with y'all. And I, um, I'm just very excited to be here today and very excited for the folks and the family members of um, the folks that are incarcerated and frankly for the state of South Carolina because this is going to save tax dollars and this is going to um, also make the state safer. So thank you all very much. Governor. Thank you, Brian. And Brian, you said save tax dollars, isn't it? About thirty-two thousand a year to keep somebody in the prison. Thirty-two thousand dollars a year. That's a lot of money. We need to get them out if we can. Uh, I think everybody has said most everything. I, I do want to thank our partners in this concordance in Wells Fargo. I had heard of Wells Fargo. Everything, everybody alive has heard of Wells Fargo. <laughs> 
How many, how many horses are pulling that stagecoach? <laughs> Is it four or six? I think it's six. But that's a great company. It really got uh, started up in New York and then moved out with the gold, uh, gold fever in California in 1849 or something like that. But uh, that's, I knew about that, but I had never heard of concordance. So the first thing I did was look in the dictionary and concordance is an, uh, is an agreement. And so what we have here is, a, is an agreement. It's an agreement between the state and Wells Fargo and concordance and these people who we are going to attempt to bring back into the mainstream of society. Now, I didn't know about concordance, but I, I do know something I've learned and read over the years about the state of South Carolina. And we are different from most places. As you know, we, we didn't start as early as some of the others did, but we, we started stronger, I believe. And our people way back then, over the years, starting in 1670, after the French and the Spanish and the English were fighting over this place, that uh, all the explorers in the centuries before that were going back to their sovereigns and telling them that, that this place that we today call South Carolina, they call the most beautiful, most lush, most promising place in the New World. And it still is. And our people came from different places under different conditions. We had as either eight or nine European countries. I think it's 14 West African cultures and 25, somewhere between 25 and 15 Native American or Indian nations. That's what came in at the beginning and for many years. Now we've got a lot of new people coming in because they have discovered us and they're coming in from all over. So if you go buy a house, hurry up because the, the prices are going up. But during those years, those centuries, we went, our people went through everything. We were, went through hurricanes, went through wars, went through earthquakes. Uh, everything, tornadoes, e everything that could possibly happen, happened here. But in, they say if it doesn't destroy you, it makes, it makes you stronger, and that's what it did. And that's why Mark Clark, after he had left uh, the Army, four-star general was president of the Citadel in Charleston, said that there's more patriotism per square inch in South Carolina than any place in the world. And it's the confluence of that Judeo-Christian traditions and that military tradition in paradise, subjecting all those people to all those trials, tribulations, various conditions, that we have now emerged to where we are today. We are fortunate we've had good leadership many, many years going back uh, throughout uh, people in this building and even before this building was here. But so here we are today, and there's an expression you remember from the ads, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. So is a life. And right now we have too many people in the prisons and not enough people working. We've got over 100,000 good jobs waiting on people. We got the best technical college system in the whole world. And we can teach people to do things. But first, we have, we have to get them started. And Director Sterling has, has worked miracles with the Department of Corrections with a fantastic staff and has, has gone from a, a troubled place over the years, as others in other states, to the one that is setting records and setting the pace with great vision and great performance. But we must do more, and we now have the opportunity to do that with this combination of inspiration and money and technique and ideas here, South Carolina, again, is going to be the first in doing something good. One other thing we do, we recognize the value of our military veterans. And that is why we in South Carolina have an agreement with the Department of uh, Defense, or Department of the Army, that any veteran that leaves the service and comes to South Carolina to live will be guaranteed at least five job interviews. And businesses are signing up. We don't want to waste these people. These that have gone off the track for various reasons, you've heard some of them, uh, they're sitting in jail, in prison, and they're going to get out one day. So what are we going to do with them? They, have it, they must have it in them somewhere to do the things that have made this state successful. So we're going to do the best we can to see the day and we find that and that our entire population is able to prosper. 
we know that South Carolina, and I want all of you to tell your children, South Carolina is the best place in the world to live, work, and raise a family. And this is one more bit of proof of that fact. So we thank you, thank all of you for being here, and if there are any questions, we'll be glad to try to answer them. Yes, ma'am. It's 60 million. Right, 60 yeah. million. But I imagine that it'll take um, future investment to continue this program down the road. Yeah. Um, are you all committed to continuing the investment, or is this going to be something that the public needs to also participate in? No, the Concordance has a program to expand beyond our contribution and a few others that have come in this early process. So we look at ours as sort of an initial investment uh, at a substantial side. To, to send a message to other companies and individuals that we believe in the program, we believe in concordance, and the fact that they're starting in a state like this, and hopefully that'll expand the opportunities to grow concordance and their expansion plans going forward beyond South Carolina. So y'all would like other private companies to also yep. Yep. private Yeah, private companies, individuals, public companies. Uh, this is a societal issue, and Concordance is looking to grow this program. We're very pleased to be an initial part of it, uh, but it, has to, it takes a lot more than this program, and the state has done that. But the success is with real leadership, like the governor and the director. Just one comment. The, um, as Bill said, um, we, um, there's an individual who could not be here today that we have to acknowledge, an individual named David Stewart. Uh, who is leading um, our campaign, and he's assembled 120 co-chairs of his campaign, primarily CEOs, leaders of influence all over the country. And so, as a result of the Wells Fargo gift, we, um, we raised the goal for the end of the year to 200 million. And if he was here today, we're not officially announcing an increase beyond that, but um, he believes very strongly that from the private sector alone, we could probably raise another 500 to 800 million for a total of a billion dollars. So yes, anybody who's here from the business community, uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about uh, your gift. Most of these gifts are uh, contributed over like a four or five year period, but that is the basis for how we'll be able to open up an additional 39 centers over the next eight years. I, let me, yeah, just, so as you know, because you cover our budget, um, you know, we're kind of the last in the buffet train uh, from, the, from the, the Senate and the House. I mean, it just, it makes sense. Corrections is last. They've stepped up and, and given us a lot of money, but, you know, there's a lot of needs, education, other law enforcement, um, higher education, things of that nature. So any money that goes to corrections across this country, I mean, and this is not just a South Carolina thing. This is across the, um, the country. This is tremendous. I mean, it's amazing what one dollar can do to help someone change their life. What one person, the number of folks I've talked to who have left prison and said, you know, someone came to my cell one day and said, hey, why don't you get in this program? Because I was just sitting around not doing anything in my staff. Well, you know, they've turned their lives around. So anything can help. You, you don't see a lot of bumper stickers saying, vote for me, I gave money to prisons. Um, you know, you see it law enforcement um, and, and education, but this is amazing what they're doing. The 60 million plus other pledges, it's going to change so many people's lives. So there's a question over here. Mary. Greenville, it's about 20% of the 6,000, um, so that re return to that area. So they're going to focus on that for now, and then we're going to have conversations later about where else we can go with this. But that's our biggest return population in the state of Greenville, obviously, two of our largest counties also. I'll just say this. I mean, we try to nudge as much as we can, um, and I'm glad you asked that question. It is optional, but if you have a loved one that's incarcerated, if you would tell them about this program and encourage them to get into this program, you will, you will change their lives. Yes, sir? Yes, great, great question. Um, each center will roughly have about 25 or 30 uh, team members. And uh, the most senior role in a center, and we're already recruiting, we've already hired some people for the uh, Greenville Spartanburg Center, 
uh, is a center director, and then um, their various roles like case managers, licensed clinical therapists, career coaches, what we call peer support specialists, people that have had similar experiences. They relate very well to people that have been incarcerated, uh, community support specialists, and then uh, each center will have a chaplain uh, associated with uh, each center. And then there are a few other roles like administrative roles. We'll have a relationship manager that will interact with our employment partners in the Greenville Spartanburg area, things like that. So if you know of anybody that uh, maybe fits one of those qualifications, let us know. But it's roughly about sure 25 people. Me. Don't steal anything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I told Director Sterling we won't poach people from his area, <laughs> even though these are the best people we've met. So, uh, but it, it, people can voluntarily <laughs> apply. <laughs> Any further questions? If not. Sure. Um, we have very few restrictions. What we're trying to do in our discussions with South Carolina and the way we've operated in Missouri is that we're trying to get a good sample of individuals um, that represent you know, the, the whatever, the 16, 20,000 people that are incarcerated. Uh, the only group that we don't take today, and we will take them, uh, are sex offenders. And I want to say that very clearly. Our hope is we will take them. It, you just have to have a whole different um, skill set to be effective. And so anytime we open up a center, we, we signed a lease in Greenville, um, but sometimes the hardest part is when we say that, um, we want to make sure that the facility is in a place that, you know, kind of abides to any type of restriction around being near schools or parks or things like that. But that's really the only group that we do not take. Um, that can be helpful. We like to. Um, the Department of uh, Correction of South Carolina, we talked about this yesterday, most people do have a home plan. They need a home plan before they're released. Um, but there may be some cases where, you know, one or two may need uh, of, um, accommodations and, you know, we'd like to partner with people like that. We do offer temporary housing for those few that don't have it. So one of our goals is to identify what I'd call smaller landlords that might have 10 12 units for just housing where um, we've inspected the facilities. They, um, they, they don't have an application process. We got to put a first month deposit, 13 month, they pay by the week. And an important point about our program that we didn't talk about here is it's voluntary, which was mentioned, but because we don't want people to work when they first come out of prison, we want to make sure they heal we pay a $12 an hour gift stipend to every participant in our program. And we've got to be the only um, mental health substance use treatment center that actually pays you to come as opposed to asking for money to come. But that's because they don't have a whole lot of resources and we really don't want them trying to get a part-time or full-time job on their own. And that continues, that stipend continues for the first nine weeks fully, and then when they're in part-time employment with one of our employment partners, then the stipend, they come back to the Center for Afternoon Program, and that goes for 11 weeks. And then they get employed full-time, and with our full-time employment partners, uh, the average raise is about $17 an hour. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got, we're on a strict time schedule for the governor. Um, we're going to conclude our press conference at this time. However, uh, Danny and others will be around to answer any questions you have um, individually, as well as for all of our guests. We have a reception immediately following this, and it's right across the street at 1221 Main Street in the Sonovas Building. It's the Adams and Reese uh, Law Offices on the 12th floor. So please make your way over to um, 1221 Main Street for the reception. Uh, Danny will be around as others to answer any questions you may have. And I want to thank all of our guest speakers for being here today and for the state of South Carolina concordance agreeing to partner together. Thank you. Thank you.